Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to Killer Pit Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Gerard, and my guest today is Carol Johnstone. Carol's award-winning short fiction has appeared in annual Best of Anthologies in the United States and United Kingdom. She lives with her husband in an old farmhouse outside Glasgow, Scotland, though her heart belongs to the sea and the wild islands of the Hebrides. Did I mess that up? Anyway, uh, she is the author of Mirrorland and the Black House. Welcome, Carol. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. This is, I, I loved this book. I did not read Mirrorland, although now I'm going to have to. Um, but it is, it's so atmospheric that there's so many things I want to talk about. But before I get, you know, I would go off on a rave about how much I loved it. Why don't you tell our listeners who have not yet read it a little bit about The Black House? Sure. Um, there's not, there's a lot I have to leave out because there's like a <laughs> giant, gigantic sort of spoiler in chapter two or something, but, right. but the sort of just is, it's, it's a gothic thriller and it's um, a kind of unusual murder mystery. It, it's set on a fictional island off the west coast of the Isle of Lewis, which is in the, the Scottish Outer Hebrides. And it's, it's really two stories kind of told side by side um, from the point of view of two different characters. The main story follows a troubled woman called Maggie Mackay, who as a child in 1999 uh, claimed that someone on the island murdered a young local man called Robert Reed. And she comes back to the island as an adult. And again, she has very... <laughs> sort of strange motives for really wanting to know what actually did happen to, to Robert and really needing to prove that he was in fact murdered. And her return kind of threatens to expose a lot of secrets that some of the islanders would really rather remained hidden. And very quickly, Maggie's kind of forced to consider how much she's willing to risk to, to un uncover the truth. And then the second story is told from Robert's perspective. It sort of follows the last six or so months of his life, right up until his kind of untimely and disturbing death, so that the, the reader kind of finds out actually what did happen to him at the same time that Maggie Maggie does. Mm -hmm. And not only did she come to that, I mean, as a whatever, how old was she when she first came to the island with her mother? She was, she was five. Yeah, five. So she's tiny. Um, and, and, you know, she, she really, it was sort of a scuttlebutt, right? She came there to be with a cameraman, you know, her mother brought her with a cameraman and a producer to kind of like out this, this sort of bizarre, you know, new life experience or whatever she was having like a you know a reincarnation experience and um and it left the town a little as you said you know we're sort of shooken and then when she comes back they're like oh no not you um <laughs> so can you tell us the inspiration for the story um was there oh. a seed how did this where did this come from because it's so creative and unusual thank you I usually have lots of different kind of seeds that that sit in my brain completely unnoticed probably for for ages months maybe even years and then eventually I sort of get a big idea usually almost always it's the place that kind of comes first and once I have that place then I start thinking of of some of the ideas that I might have had already for other stories and I kind of work them into that story so the the so main inspiration really was the Outer Hebrides themselves, which I know very well. I've lived there not for very long, but I lived on Lewis for 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 a while. Um, and the other kind of thing, well, there, another thing. It's such a it's so difficult for me to talk about the Outer Hebrides because they're so strange. I've never been anywhere that is quite like them. They're about sort of 40 I think miles off the coast of Scotland there is kind of far west in Scotland as you can get and there is really nothing between the the Outer Hebrides and Canada except the Atlantic it is just they're very kind of out there on their own and 
it's a very different way of life there um, from the mainland. And when I was living there, I really, I'd gone there on holiday lots and that was different because they sure. were there in the summer season, you know, it was very, very different. When we went, we stayed in, I think it was 2017, we stayed for about three quarters of a year. Wow. And we stayed on the West Coast, in the West Coast, the Atlantic Coast of the really kind of remote part. Mm -hmm. And we were staying in this, this settlement, this tiny settlement of about four houses called Cliff. And it's just this headland all on its own, really. And there was a beach, Cliff Beach, kind of right next to it. We got there, gosh, it must have been the very beginning of autumn, so around about September time. Mm. And it was busy. You know, it was a very surfy beach. So there were loads of camper vans full of surfers right across the road from us. There were, you know, there were people in all the other houses and it was lovely. And when you're really far north in Scotland um, in the summer, it, it doesn't really get dark. Right, you know, it stays right. bright for so so long so at that point it was still really nice you know and and it's um all of a sudden I think it must have been about mid-October um we we woke up one day and realized that all the surface had gone that the campsite was completely empty and all the other houses had been holiday lets so they were also empty and we suddenly realized that we were just there on our own you know we had this entire headland and beach and everything just to ourselves and almost immediately at the same time the weather kind of arrived you know because it's lovely 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 and the the, the islands are a lot warmer than the Scottish mainland because they're kind of in a gulf stream but they're very very stormy and so all of a sudden all these storms started barreling in from the Atlantic we would lose power for kind of days at a time there was no mobile signal there at all and we didn't have 4g or anything like that um oh. we really didn't have much internet full stop the house had some but but it was very intermittent there were no lights anywhere you know it's incredibly you think that you kind of know what that will feel like, but when you actually yeah. live there, it's, yeah. it's weird. Yeah. It's such a strange thing to, to kind of get your head around. At the time I was living there, I was writing Maryland, but that was when I kind of got the idea for the Black House. I thought there is no way that I'm not selling, setting a book in this kind of, you know, an environment because it was just so almost otherworldly. Right. You know? And um, so that was the main thing. Um, and it's also the islands are known as a, as a thin place as being a thin place which I do use in the book you do and actually that's sort of one of my questions is I would love to have you so explain to listeners what a thin place is I've not I had not heard of that but what is interesting and I want to come back to your experience because that is so fascinating but talk about a thin place because that's really interesting so thin place is um, it's kind of it, it's very difficult to explain without sounding I always do it badly <laughs> but it's kind of like a spiritual landscape it's it's a place there are lots of thin places all over the world and it's a place where um the kind of wall or the veil between this world and other worlds is supposed to be the thinnest mm -hmm. um so somewhere like Stonehenge for example in England is said to be a thin place it's said sure. to have kind of like you know really really sort of spiritual place a a place that's usually subject to a lot of Celtic um, legends and mythology. Um, the Vikings had a different way of describing it, but it was essentially the same thing. They had sort of something called, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, but <laughs> Go they for have um, Utengards and Inengards. And okay. Inengards means inside the fence, literally yeah. inside the fence. And that's the human world. Right. And then they had Utengards, which was outside the fence. And that was where all the other worlds were. That's where all the kind of gods and, and giants and, and what have mm. you were. And so they, they kind of, they also thought that the Outer Hebrides was, was Utengards and Utengards because they kind of settled, the Outer Hebrides were one of the first parts of Britain that the, that the um, Norsemen actually settled in. A lot of the place names are, are in Norse. And so the whole the whole place is such a strange environment. I mean, if you're driving around the island, they have standing stones that are older than Stonehenge everywhere. 
you know wow. they're just in fields there are cows and sheep with you know it's it if I don't know if you've ever been to Stonehenge I've but... never been to yeah no I have not and I've never been to Scotland at all although it is really up on my list so um I think I'm gonna have to I might not go in the winter but I definitely no. want to check out these islands um but yeah I mean Stonehenge itself though is just like a it's got a huge visitor center, you know, a massive car park, merchandise coming, you know, everywhere. You, right. you can't go into the stones. There's a huge cordon all the way around. And all you can do is walk in this absolutely huge circle, very far away from the stones around them. Whereas in the Outer Hebrides, you just walk into a field and there they are. Yeah, you know? that <laughs> sounds completely... like the place to go. So I have to ask, I mean, it's it, what a fascinating place to be living um, and what a fascinating place to be a writer, right? I mean, it is, sounds, I mean, the book is so, the, the place, the place in the book is so, is a character, very much a character of its own with its storms and its rage and it's the way the weather changes and, you know, you're the lashing of the rain and the, I mean, it is, and, you know, you know, like you said, she's, Maggie's just trying to make it back from the little pub to her 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 little tiny cottage, the black house, and she's you know she's turned her this way and that because it's just so dark and it really does it it's it's it of course it's so atmospheric and it's terrifying, right? I mean, it, we feel terror just by thinking what the hell is going to happen to this poor woman, <laughs> and then the idea and you I think you describe the thin place with the fence analogy in the book um with the idea and it, you know the idea and it feels so you it's not a ghost story per se but it does have that like it does have that sort of sense that there are that there are presences of other beings around her that are not living breathing you know humans and some things happen you know some birds and things happen that are the, the poor thing I mean it's, it's creepy as I'll get out but I want to go back for a second because I'm so curious about, first of all, what took you to the Hebrides? And um, and when you say it, there are four houses in, in the little village, were there, so was it just you and your partner the, for a, a year or nine months in the winter? How did you get supplied? Like, <laughs> I know this is not related to the book, but it's so <laughs> fascinating. And it clearly, it, cl it makes sense so much sense as to how this story came from that so tell just come back to that a little bit I have so many questions okay so I am how we got there was um oh it's it's a very long-winded story <laughs> my life now is very very different to how it was in 2017 in 2017 okay. I was living in the southeast of England in a very busy town about an hour from London okay. um I worked for the NHS um, I worked in cancer services oh. and I'd done that full time for about 20 years and I'd kind of always done my writing in my spare time you know at the weekends and holidays mm. things like that it sold a lot of short stories like you said but I wasn't I had this kind of idea well one day of course I will be a full-time writer that's absolutely going to happen but but it wasn't happening you know mm. so I was just living my life and nothing was really changing and then a lot of things, not mainly bad things really happened in a very short period of time. You know, a very close family member died. Sorry, I got yeah. quite a sort of life-changing medical um, diagnosis and it kind of forced me to stop and look at the future. I was never very good at doing that. I would just live day to, to day and whatever will happen will happen. And I think I kind of had a proper moment where I thought, right, you need to start kind of thinking if this is how you want to live the rest of your life then fine but if it's not you need to start doing something about sort of changing life I wasn't particularly yeah. unhappy but I wouldn't say I was very fulfilled either right um, so I convinced my husband my poor husband to <laughs> to that we should leave our jobs take um, a year and a half out of our jobs and just kind of go traveling um spend all our lifetime saving seller house yep. the whole thing you know I just thought um let's just do that and we decided to to move to Europe for a bit um and we decided to move to Scotland for a bit and the idea was at the end of this 18 months we decided did we want to go back to England did we want to right. um move to Europe did we want to move back home to Scotland 
<laughs> and so we went to to the island of Cyprus um, for it was only about six or seven months because that was all we could afford. Um, but it was beautiful. I'd ha all had this um, idea in my head forever that I wanted to write a novel on a Greek island. Yeah, this is my. <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> sound dream. terrible to me, right? Right. No. And so that's what I, that's what I did. And then when the money started getting really low, we came back. And we just kind of moved around Scotland because by that point, we'd been in England 20 years. We'd really never, we, when we went home, we just went home to see our families. You know, we always went to the same place. And so it was really nice just to kind of stay in the Highlands and then also the islands because we loved um, the islands in particular in the West. So that's what we did. We just kind of moved around. I mean, we ended up um, after staying in the Highlands for a bit, which was freezing, and we ended up going to to the Isle of um, Lewis and Harris. And then we found a place and just decided, to, right, why don't we just stay here? Because like I said, when we first got there, it was lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, yeah, so, so when you were talking about those other houses in Cliff, they were, we didn't realize they were all holiday lets. We thought that, you know, there were other people. And we realized very quickly that, you know, there, there wasn't anybody that we were going to have to be able to kind of befriend because they right. were constantly leaving. Right. Um, and then when they were gone, it really was the at cliff itself was on its own headland, but it was also on a, a, a bigger headland that had a couple of other villages on it. But they were a few miles away. So you were, yeah. you were kind of isolated almost three times over. You know, there was nothing um you could go days without seeing a soul we used to go to um Stornoway which is the main town um uh, on Lewis and it's on the east coast all the main kind of places were on the east and it would take us the best part of a day we'd sort of trek over in there in the car we would get all our or we'd restock we'd refuel we'd get our kind of fix of of going to the pub and going to a restaurant and doing all this right. kind of, you know, back in civilization and then we would drive back at, in the dark um, and oh. yeah, and, and there we would stay for another month before oh. we went back. <laughs> wow. So, well, you know, I, my husband and I, before we had children in, uh, early in our marriage, spent a year and traveled um, similarly backpacked really and kind of made a little circle around the world. Although, you know, when you make a tiny circle, wow. you don't get to any places, but um, I always say to people, we've been married 28 years, but I'm always like, but that one year counts for another 10 because the intensity of, I mean, and it's, and we had other, you know, we could go and, you know, when we were in, wherever we could go and talk to people that were not each other, but that it, the intensity of that is such an interesting experience, right? I mean, it really tests mm -hmm. how much you guys can, um, <laughs> put up with. So good for you guys. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> And what, I mean, and clearly you weren't writing, so you were writing Mirrorland there. And again, I'm sad I haven't read Mirrorland because I'm so curious. Uh, and I know it was incredibly well received. Um, Stephen King calls it dark and devious and beautifully written. So that's, I don't know if you can do much better than that. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, was that, is that also set in, is, is, is location a really big character in Mirrorland? It, it is, it is, but it's in a very different, different ways so Mirrorland is set in a house um, okay. a very big <clears throat> old creepy house um, and originally I'd planned when I'd kind of first been thinking about it again the setting came first the house came mm -hmm. first before anything else I was planning on setting it in the, the Scottish Highlands somewhere kind of in the middle of nowhere and have this big huge crumbling mansion a bit like um, the haunting of Hill House you know that yeah. kind of vibe yeah yeah but um but when I started plotting it, I thought oh, it doesn't really work. And my grandparents, um, they died in the 90s, but they they had this Georgian villa um, in Edinburgh. So right in the middle of the capital city, it was near the, yeah. the sort of dock side. Wow. And um, every time I kept thinking about the story, I kept setting it in there. It was a it was a completely mad house. It was falling to pieces. But it had all these creepy little rooms that seemed mm -hmm. to serve no function. And it had this big vaulted cellar that we weren't allowed in because it was, you know, on the verge of collapse. 
collapsing. Wow. You know, there were all sorts of parts of the house that were great for when you were a kid, probably not so great to live in as an adult. But right. <laughs> and so that's what where it ended up being set in, yeah. in my grandparents' house because Mirrorland is about um things that go on behind closed doors that that nobody else would would ever ever believe would happen mm -hmm. um, or suspect would happen and I kind of like the idea of having this big creepy old house but sticking it in a capital city you know right. where it is surrounded by all these other right. other right. places and it's like, like hiding in plain sight right exactly right. exactly I thought that was kind of a bit more insidious a bit creepier so, it <laughs> so is, that was right? the setting. Oh, well, that, I'm, I will, I'm really looking forward to that. That, so this is, but it, it, um, I mean, the, the place you describe and I mean, what you guys, I mean, at least Maggie has a small community of people that she can talk to. It's amazing. So, um, and one of the sort of, and we talked a little bit about this sort of the re idea, idea of reincarnation. Something you mentioned is that a lot of kids believe um, they, that they were, they're reincarnated. And I wasn't sure if that's a true phenomenon. And did you come upon that in your research? I hadn't heard that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it was years ago. I think that was one of the, these things that got stuck in my brain at some point mm -hmm. and it's just mm -hmm. sort of waited there. Um, yeah, no, I'd, I'd read, I can't remember exactly um, where or when I read about it, but I, I did. And it was so interesting. And it was so interesting that I ended up buying um, a book. I can't for the life of me remember what it, what it was called, but it was this, this um, psychologist and he had collected over decades all these stories. He would kind of go around the world and he would talk to these children every time they kind of claimed that, that, that mm -hmm. they were somebody else. And it was, it was so interesting because it was all kinds of cultures. It was all kinds of um, religions. It, interesting. You know, it, was, it, was, it wasn't just because mm -hmm. that's what that particular culture believes in. And a lot of the things that they would say um, would not really be verifiable in the sense that you could never actually prove that, yes, this person existed because what they remembered wasn't, you know, right. oh, my name was this, 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 and this is where I live. Right. But sometimes it was very kind of specific, credible and yeah, and specific. And sometimes they'd speak to, say, a family member of the person that they think that this was and they would believe it also. So it's it's a really fascinating, really fascinating subject. And it is what generally tends to happen to these kids is that they they talk about it incessantly. They believe really a lot of them that they are still this person. I think it's quite um, distressing for a lot of these children yeah. because they're like, oh, what's going on? You know, right. why? <laughs> right. what's happened? Um, right. And then it kind of peaks. I think they round about the age of four to six. And then generally when they get to about eight years old, they suddenly forget or it, they gradually forget yeah. or it just goes. And eventually they don't remember it at all. They don't remember thinking these things. And there is a kind of school of thought, I think around eight years old, your brain, I'm, I'm probably butchering this explanation as well, but your brain undergoes some sort of physiological and um, anatomical change. It's the kind of the last big change in, in your brain as you're growing up. And so they reckon that the, at this point, that's why they then kind of forget everything that they, they that they remembered so it's it's just really interesting I mean when you read some of the stories you just think wow you know right. and these kids are so consistent they never change what right right well and Maggie's story and, and you know it's interesting because of course you know the the thing with Maggie's story and her and her own question is you know we we think as skeptics we're like well wh wh what story was her mother feeding her or you know mm. who was after money for something like that's of course what you know but it does um you know, and she, as a grown up, is like, "What was you know? What exactly was that?" And yet, you know, um, it is such a part of her for of her youth and her her um, growing up. And she she really has to you know go back and explore it. Um, 
sort of despite, like you said, the risks of doing that. Um, anyway, it's mm. such a fascinating, I found that really fascinating. And I love to hear, I mean, I love the idea that we just really don't know, right? We do not know yeah. what happens after this. Um, <laughs> no matter what your you know, religion is, we just have, we really don't have any idea, which is, you know, is such an, so ripe with opportunities for novelists. And I love oh, that you uh, dance around that. So another um, thing that I had never heard of, um, aside from the thin place is the, and I'm going to mess this up because it's French in, even though my name is French, I cannot speak it. <laughs> my sister should be here. She could help me. It's the Jama Vu, which is the opposite of deja vu. And can you, that mm -hmm. comes up in the book and I, and I had never heard of that. Can you explain that for reader, uh, listeners? Yeah. So it, 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 I hadn't heard of it actually until I started looking into um this this whole more well, Maggie is is bipolar um and so a lot of her issues stem from the fact that she she can't 100 percent always trust herself or her yeah. her kind of judgments uh, particularly at the beginning of the novel because she's just had a kind of major psychotic episode and she's just got out of the hospital and there's all sorts of other things going on in her life um and she Jamais vu means ne never seen. So déjà vu means already seen. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then jamais vu means never seen. And it's kind of the opposite, like you said, of, of déjà vu in that if you're sort of going through it, you everything, people that you know or places that you know suddenly become completely unfamiliar. It's as if they're completely strange bizarre and you've never seen this person or this this place before um and it's if you have bipolar one you can sometimes um have jamais vu it's kind of a, a disassociation um mm -hmm. where you just you can no longer kind of understand what you're you're seeing well you can understand it but you just don't recognize it right it feels and like it's somebody else's life exactly yeah. like like yeah. you've you're just again a bit like um these kids where you're just like i don't know what's happening because i'm not this person you know right um so it's really interesting i find these kind of things really interesting i think if i had my time over and um if i was going back to university or whatever i would love to study um psychology and things like because it's so interesting it and is I really so think, yeah oh can you imagine experiencing that i mean it must be terrifying it must be yes. absolutely terrifying it sounds horrible <laughs> um yes. and actually since we're talking about her um you know i want to talk about mental illness because that's a you know her that for maggie that's a really big weight uh of course mm. and then of course you know if you're you know when you're mentally ill everything every sort of strange thing that happens to you becomes a question of is that really happening to me did i invent that you know, or did I, am I remembering something incorrectly? Um, mm. Is this real or imagined? And, you know, in this, in that, living in that is got to be a really, a very much a, a form of torture, I think. Um, mm. There is this wonderful line you write <laughs> on page 50. I have a, I have a tendency to <laughs> mark all my favorite pages, but this one I wrote out because it's so, it's so accurate and it's so relevant and I loved it so much. And it's, it is, um, Mental illness is a tool of repression and ignorance. It's a way for men, for society to persecute us, to call us hysterical, to keep us witches inside our cages. And I got shivers. I just gave myself shivers again, reading it out loud, because I think it is so true. And the idea of sort of, it's not, I mean, I think mental illness for anybody is, is you know, is a tool, of, you know, society uses that tool of repression, but particularly I think for women, right? It's this idea of, oh, she's hysterical. Like she controls her responses and she can, she's just being dramatic. Um, yeah. And I wanted you to sort of talk about that a little bit because I just felt like that really strikes me to a core about how we, society treats both mental illness and women, you know, mm -hmm. and emotion to some extent, right? That's hysteria. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I completely agree. Um, I was a bit weary of making Maggie bipolar at first because I didn't want to use it just as a kind of vehicle to make her an unreliable narrator or, you know, oh, well, you know, she's thinking that because she has has this mental illness. I, I didn't want to kind of use it as a gimmick. And 
And I mean, I don't have bipolar. I have absolutely no idea yeah. what that would feel like. So I did do a lot of research. I spoke to Mind, which is a British um, charity who kind of gave me loads of information mm -hmm. and put me in touch with people um, who were willing to talk to me about their own experiences <clears throat> with having it. And I thought, I want to use this because the, the line that you read, that's um, Maggie's mother. Um, mm -hmm. That's what her opinion is because she was also suffering from right. illness. And I wanted it to be, Maggie is so conflicted because her mum is very different from her. Her mum right. doesn't believe that she's got any kind of mental illness at all. Her mum thinks that she's psychic. Um, her mum believes that she can sort of communicate with the dead and that she can see visions and things like that. And there is this ambiguity throughout the book as to whether or not she can. Because, right. you know... You could you could be both. You, there was the, and it's the same with with Maggie um, and and thinking that she was reincarnated. You know, she's she doesn't know whether that's her mom's influence. She doesn't know right. whether that's her her mental illness sort of right. manifest. She doesn't right. know if it's true. So it was it was a way really to look at all of that, and then also exactly as you say, the way that women in particular are treated um in those sorts of situations it it doesn't just affect them in the here and now it can affect them for their whole lives Maggie is so uncertain of herself mm -hmm. and it's as much because of outside influences and prejudices as it is her own kind of thoughts of and so I really really wanted to talk about that but it was quite scary I've never really written about mental illness before mm. And I really didn't want anybody who did say have bipolar one to kind of read it and go, oh, that's, you know, that's awful that she's using that. Yeah, in that way. I don't, hard. I mean, you know, I hope that, that you don't never get that response because to be honest, I think we need to see more of it, right? We need to see it normalized because, you mm -hmm. know, people, oh, bipolar, that person is just going to like rant when you know or are they going to be all manic and then they're going to be in bed for a month I mean I think it's I think it there are it's it's such a it's such a continuum and until we start to talk about it and and how it you know how it looks different every you know in different cases and and all mm. of that I think it just has its it has a weight and the people who suffer from it um don't you know we all want to see ourselves in the pages right and we all want to and it's not maggie is not an unlikable character she's not a evil person so we're not you're not in my mind you're not making the disease into something that it's not you're it's she grabs mm. she really struggles and she's really trying to figure herself out and i can't imagine that anybody suffering from that wouldn't be you know feel like that was a really fair treatment of it so mm. i'm glad you did i found that i really do find and i think it's you know the prevalence of mental illness not necessarily bipolarism but every you know so much and now after the pandemic in particular right the world is mm. mental illness is you know it's potentially our next you know epidemic right oh, i mean it's absolutely. just yeah so i really appreciate that and you know i appreciated that also that there was no like clean fix right i mean there's just not yeah. you don't just be like okay well we solved that and isn't that, um, you know, isn't that lovely? Because uh, that's <laughs> obviously not how it works. Um, no. But, so the other thing I love about this book is it's really a book about secrets. Um, you know, everybody, like you said, everybody sort of is holding something so tightly. And the idea is that there's also some some line you, you talk about how we hold them so tightly that they sort of infect us, right? And that, mm. you know, letting them out um, is a way of, you know, we hope that it, um, will release the burden, uh, um, but unfortunately, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, the idea yeah. that that it isn't really, you know, that isn't as effective. And I, I kind of wanted to sort of hear you talk about that because I think that's such a big part of this book too is how mm. much we hold um, private and, and to our detriment, almost, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, I think I really love gothic stories. I always try to make what I write feel quite gothic. And I think that one of the main things about Gothic stories is that there is always this big kind of mystery or secret underneath the, the actual story. And that's what you're kind of having to get to. But I think as well with the Black House, there are lots of secrets. I mean, there's obviously one really big one, but there's lots of other secrets. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think um, 
particularly in a community, in an island community like that, a very small island community, the secrets become huge, but they also it also kind of becomes a, a habit, you know, that they will all just keep secrets um, because that's what they do. I suppose mm -hmm. when you're living in a tiny community, you really rely on each other. But mm -hmm. equally, everybody knows absolutely everything about everybody mm -hmm. else. So mm -hmm. you, if you do have a secret, then it must be an awful struggle to, <laughs> to keep right? it. You, and in this, in this case, actually, it's sort of an interesting generational thing, right? There's like, there's the, the people who kind of come back or the, or the children, they're, they're not privy mm -hmm. to necessarily, you know, p parents keep secrets from their children. And then those secrets, you know, there might be a whole, you know, bunch of people that of a certain age that sort of know what happened to, you know, Joe, but, but their children don't know because nobody talks about any of that, right? It's just, exactly, it's sort of like, yeah. it's woven into the, the community at one level. And then nobody, it's since nobody talks, you know, nobody talks about, it, nobody acknowledges it. So there's this whole, you know, the, the new generation has no idea yeah, no what idea. sort of stuff is there yeah. in this tiny community. I found that also, it felt very real and very authentic and also really like, what, you know, what is it that we do? Um, yeah, oh, and definitely. It, Thank it's you. It's so interesting. I mean, what I really, really, really enjoyed doing was that Robert's story takes place 25 years before Maggie's. Right. Um, so a lot of the characters are in both, and mm -hmm. obviously they're 25 years older uh, the mm -hmm. second time you see them. And they some of them change hugely, and some of them don't really change at all. Right. But the part the sort of secrets and all that part has a big effect on how or what they become the kind of person that, that they become and Absolutely. some people obviously it is, it's a very bad thing but for other people it, it, it's not and other people it's right. just a way of life so it's I found that really interesting I've never done that before I've never kind of looked at I've done stories where a, one character has maybe mm -hmm. aged a certain amount but to have different characters it was really mm. it was really cool it was really challenging because I thought well some people do completely change over the course of their lives right. and are almost unrecognizable from the people that they used to be but equally um, other people just don't, don't change right at all <laughs> right at no. all despite the but despite the um you know, despite the pressures on them that would you think would create change, it just doesn't. Mm. And there are, I, you know, the the we didn't we didn't talk too much about. You know, there's all these people around uh, Maggie who are, you know, she sort of who have different influences on her. You know, and they're, you know, the town itself does not really want her to be there, but begrudgingly, people sort of, you know, take her in, and and she has mm -hmm. some, you know, friendships and some, you know, some more sort of tensions between people but I do I did find that the way that they changed between the in the 25 years and in, in the, the you know reading back and forth between Maggie's timeline and Robert's timeline was really fascinating to put those pieces together and and I was mm -hmm. you know I'm curious about always curious about process when it comes to books like this do you just go do you, did you write like Robert Maggie Robert Maggie or did you sort of write Robert and then write Maggie do you, you know how did you sort of in the process do it Oh, I did it. I always have to do it exactly as it appears in the book. Um, yeah. I know some people who sort of write the last chapter first and stuff that blows my mind. Mm -hmm. I could never, ever, ever do something like that. I think um, if there's like a, a spectrum of people who, who, I don't know, don't do any plan planning at all, just kind of have an idea, sit down in front of the laptop and start mm -hmm. writing. And then all the way up to people who who plan it to the point where they know exactly what goes into every single chapter. That's mm -hmm. me, you know. Oh, interesting. <laughs> right okay. at that end. I plan and I plan and then I okay. I plan some more. I know exactly what's going to happen. I think with um with Meadowland and with the Black House, um, I want there to be lots of twists and reveals. And obviously you've got the really big ones at the end, mm -hmm. but I also really like as a reader, I really like mm -hmm. lots of little mm -hmm. kind of reveals all the way through because it, it helps with the pacing, but it also kind of really kind of get keeps you interested and surprised. Yeah, it makes it hard to put the book down for sure. And you do that yeah. really beautifully. So you spend so you spend a lot of time ahead of time, really yes. thinking through the book and and outlining the book and and yeah. 
creating the twists and and then and then when you sit down to write is it easier because you're like I know what happens yeah it is for me um I usually see the 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 very kind of end first that's the Mm -hmm. sort of my beginning Mm -hmm. point and I always see the book as a kind of movie it sounds really weird but in my head I can see all the scenes I see how they're going to go and I kind of sit and I think about it for ages and I do that while I'm plotting and doing all the research so you know if I have to I don't know if I have to research forensics or police Mm -hmm. procedures or whatever I do all that before I start writing so that I don't have to stop Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the end, you know, I, it would take me maybe three months easily to to plot and research. Yeah. Um, but then by the end, I know exactly what I'm doing for each chapter. And I, I all I have to do is write. You know, I don't really I mean, sometimes things change because I, as I go along, I think, oh, well, that doesn't work as well as mm-hmm. I thought it would. And I have mm-hmm. to change it. But really, the, the kind of the whole first few drafts until it's kind of ready to be seen by by either my agent or, or editor is probably about um another three four months on top of that so I would say at least 50 well, possibly about 50 percent of the time is just preparation yeah and I know that some other writers because I've spoken to them they say oh I would hate that I would hate Me too. to sit down I'm, I'm one of them <laughs> I would be like if I got out to I first of all, I would hate to just sit I'm not gonna just not write not writing but also I think mm. it, I always am like wouldn't I be like oh now I know the story so I'm kind of like oh I don't need to write that one I know yeah, that that's exactly know. what what people say to me but I I don't feel that way I, I can't really describe it I think, I think all of the kind of preparation sort of the build up to writing is is I get more excited about mm-hmm. writing it after that I really yeah. want it to 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 end up as I've got it in my head because by that point I will have had the whole thing in my head for quite a long time right I mean I remember I was talking to a really good writer friend of mine a few years ago about process you know because I think that's all writers ever talk to each other so true (laughs) right right how do you do that right yeah and she said she was a real she was the complete opposite from me she just she would just write and but we worked out that it took us about the same length of time to have a draft ready to show. It's just that mine would maybe be draft three or four and hers would be draft 10 or 11 or, you know, Uh, it would be much, much more. But it needs, she needs more drafts, right? Because she's just winging it. I mean, that's sort of how I feel. She's kind of doing the ideas. All of a sudden you you realize, oh, that isn't going to work. And you're at like Mm. 30,000 words. So you have to sort of back up and pivot. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I always think it'd be lovely to be able to outline a book and be like, okay, on Monday, I'm going to write chapter, you know, but it's, it, it's <laughs> never worked for me. And I think that's the thing about writing, right? Is it just it is it, whatever works works. Um, definitely, definitely. And you can try new things. And I certainly have, but I mm. not successfully. <laughs> I've always I been like, think, well, yeah, back. You, you do. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm the same. I've tried not to plot. I've tried to do other ways um, of editing and of writing and I think that the, the the one that you arrived at first that's what you're supposed to do that's just how you you're made and no matter how you try and change that that's still going to be the best the best way of doing it I mean it's it can be a pain and sometimes it is a bit like oh I don't want to write the next bit you know because I know mm. what's coming that kind of thing so you have once you've planned it out you still have to write it in order you can't just go and write Absolutely. a fun scene later in the book no you're like, I, I don't ever want- ever do that I never do I don't I think I'd be worried that some continuity would be lost or you know because although I've plotted it out I haven't really, I almost always write in first person. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really incorporated um, how a character is going to be feeling by chapter Mm -hmm. 18 or whatever, you know? So I feel like (laughs) I just, I cannot, I cannot do it out of order. It's, Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's like putting your clothes on inside out or something, you know? It just feels (laughs) wrong. I can't do it. Right. (laughs) No, that's a fair, that's totally a fair analogy. I love it. Well, um, I, you know, I think it is, like you said, it's what, what, what's whatever works, which works. And so, um, yeah. and this works. So was, but Marilyn, that was your first novel or just, that was your first novel? I, well, I had written another novel before then. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it didn't go anywhere. I, I yeah. did get an agent um, at the time, 
but he he couldn't sell it and mm -hmm. in hindsight it was a very strange book <laughs> I'm not well, sure you have to have a practice <laughs> I feel like you need a practice book that's fair <laughs> everybody has to have a practice book um <laughs> no that that yeah well that is I mean for this to be your second I mean your second published book is really it's so it's a, such a wonderful story and I, it's so cinematic so I can I can see it on the you know um I can absolutely see it on the big screen that it'll be so fun to watch I only ever want to watch the movies of books I've read. I'm like, I don't really care about the movie yes. that I haven't read, but the book I've read, I'm like, I'd love to see that made into a movie. Mm. It'd be so exciting. So I have to ask, like, you know, where do you come down, Carol, on reincarnation? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm one of these terrible people. I'm so on the fence about everything. I'm very kind of credulous about everything. I never think, oh, definitely not. Um I'm not particularly religious. I was brought up in the Church of Scotland, which is um, Protestant. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I find it very rigid. I find mm -hmm. a lot of, um, a lot of what they said made no sense to me, even as a child. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, they, I, I am really interested in religion in general. Yeah. Um, the similarities and the differences mm -hmm. but I think spiritualism in particular if I was to to kind of come down on one thing more than another I think spiritualism is the thing that interests me the most it's the thing mm -hmm. that it kind of makes a lot of sense to me um reincarnation of course is is you know a lot of different religions believe one way or another in reincarnation but it's I think it's one of these things that it's very tangible. All these books, all these stories are so interesting. And mm -hmm. I'm, when I, you know, I studied science um, right. at university and mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think there's a lot of the scientists still in me. To me, something like reincarnation is really interesting, even just from a scientific point of view. When, when right. You about these right. So I, 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 I agree. Either or. I don't, I, I, I would completely be, um, happy to 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 believe somebody definitely mm -hmm. um until it was proved otherwise mm -hmm. so. exactly I love it it's hard to talk about those like people report near-death experiences so many of them are so yes. similar yes. like huh. it's you know it's either that the brain works in a very specific mm -hmm. way when you get that close to death and so Absolutely. that's what people are reporting or else mm -hmm. You do. You go to the light, and then you walk away from the light. I mean, I find I'm sort of the same. And I I also studied uh, science, although I I didn't spend any time doing science. Uh, mm -hmm. I ended up in finance, which is you know anyway. But <laughs> um, before I was a full time writer. But um, but I do think it's in. I think there's a very. I I think there's a very fine line um, between sort of you know, sp and I think spirituality is a lovely way of can be religion it can be something other than than mm -hmm. religion but um but i think spirituality and science probably are much closer con um connected than we we like to to consider so yeah uh, I, no i think so too i totally hear that so um now that we're you know everyone is going to devour the black house um <laughs> and we haven't ruined anything i'm so proud of us because there's <laughs> so much there to there's so many opportunities to talk about all the things we're i not know talk about. i always get really get nervous i was like oh don't give anything away no, I know. <laughs> no no i i think we did a really good job so we're not gonna we're not gonna talk anymore about the black house so we don't mess it up <laughs> now when we've come so far um but i want to ask so you know what is next carol what are you working on so um writing the third book um it's been the hardest actually weirdly to to do um I've been writing it for quite a while now and I'm hoping to have it sort of in a fit state for someone else to read by maybe the beginning of next year fingers crossed uh, I'm really um strange about letting other people read even my agent read anything I've written it has to be at least semi-decent you know in good, I hear that good right shape. I, told, I can't do it I otherwise. understand that I understand that. that's you know <laughs> and you the thing about having anybody read your stuff is that you can only get a first impression once right exactly, so you can't just be yes. like well now I'll read it this time and see uh -huh. it's just it's it is this time. time. Uh -uh. There's only <laughs> one sort of first time so I appreciate that exactly. as well and is that one also sort of is there a location that you 
are you comfortable talking about it or no? Yeah, talk- yeah, no, I am. Okay. I'm, I'm usually, um, I, I don't tend to go into too much detail cause, just because I always think I'm going to jinx it somehow. I don't know. If it's uh, not well, then good. don't. I, I understand but- that. This is a superstitious <laughs> business. So you feel free to tell us we have to wait. <laughs> it's, um, it's another gothic thriller. Um, it's very much in the same kind of vein as Mirrorland and, and the Black House. It's set on another island, although it's a very different kind of island. Um, but it's actually set in in England this time it's off the the southeast coast of England and um, it's another one where the kind of setting came first it's this it's a fictional island but it's in um, a real area a real place where there are all these little islands and it's it's completely landscape wise completely different to Scotland it's incredibly flat just for miles and miles and miles and these islands are really really low lying so they're they're very much at risk from um, storm surges, mm-hmm. tidal waves, that kind of thing, mm. and they're surrounded by this this network of kind of really muddy creeks and sand blanks and mud flats and quicksand mm. and you know bogs that you can go into oh, fall gosh. into and never be seen again. <laughs> and it's it's on the Thames estuary, so okay, you have these tides that just go out for miles and miles and miles and miles, just this flat horizon. And then they come roaring back in, you know, faster mm-hmm. than a person can run. They, they, people are drowned all the time on, the, on these, these tides. And it just comes roaring back in up to, the, up to these islands. And a lot of the um, islands are owned by the Ministry of Defence. Um, and they're used as firing ranges, as places mm-hmm. for them to test out ammunition. And that's mm-hmm. been going on since the sort of Second World War. So there's an element of, I mean, when you go there, it's such a creepy landscape. It's very, very sinister. It's prone to sort of fog and mist. And mm-hmm. you have all these barbed wire fences and you cannot come into this. Bit. Right, you know, right. You know, like, so the story itself is set on this island and it's um, it's basically it's about drug smuggling it's about um betrayal and secrets and all the usual kind of stuff um, adultery um murder of course (laughs) gotta have murder (laughs) absolutely and it's um it's about a really kind of dysfunctional community that lives on this island and and again all the kind of secrets and things that are going on underneath underneath oh it sounds wonderful well i i do love i mean I love the way you describe your, you know, your your places because they're so different from what most of us have ever experienced, right? I mean, um, the the and the water elements for you, um, there's, mm. you know, and and that the way you describe that, I have heard a little bit about those people do like little digs in the in the estuaries when the Thames when the water goes out. And then they have to be clear of it when the water comes back yeah, in. But yeah. I haven't experienced that. I think I need to, sounds like I need to plan a trip and come and um, check out some of these, these strange places. Take a, I'm going <laughs> to take, take the Carol Johnstone tour. Yeah. <laughs> Minus like the murder, you know, hopefully. Yeah, um, yes, you're clear well, this is, yeah exactly. Well, this, um, it's, this was so fun. And this book is out. Actually, I think our podcast will release today and on the day of your book out it's um so that's the third of january this is our first um you'll be our first uh podcast release for 2023 and i'm i'm really excited um thank you so much for joining me and for um, letting me take a look at the black house because um it's really really it's all it's got all the things and it's i love your gothic (laughs) Um, your dark, dark gothic books, and I'm looking forward to Mirrorland. And what, I, whatever, do you have a title? Probably too soon. No, not yet. Not I yet. know titles are sometimes <laughs> the worst part, right? Um, but thank you. It was such a so fun to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've loved your questions. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. And everybody, <laughs> this has been Killer Women uh, with our guest Carol Johnstone. I'm Danielle Gerard, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.